Well, welcome to another edition of the Digistyle Sports Show right here on islandstats.com. I'm your host, Earl Baston, and joining me yet again is, I ain't too happy about this red hat thing, but <laughs> Jason Juggling Jay Ford. Jay, big weekend in sports for Bermuda, racket-breaking performance that would have uh, given us possibly another medal in a different event. Mm-hmm. Um, boxing. You can yes. ask him. Yes. Uh, we had uh, sailing in the great in the Hamilton Harbor with these youngsters uh, vying for spots mm-hmm. uh, in a international competition later this month and into next month. Dominique Mayo competed in the Dominican Republic. In the heat. In the heat. Yes. But you know we have a lot to talk about. But first, let's get this message from our sponsor. Bermuda, listen up. D-Music is here exclusively for Digicel customers. Open up a world of music at your fingertips and access millions of songs from free. With D-Music, you can easily search for your favorite artists and create playlists to fit your lifestyle. Plus, you have the option to download music to your device so you can find a song for any moment, even when offline. D-Music comes with one gig of free data to stream and download songs without it impacting your data usage. That's 32 hours worth of music. Visit us in-store or online to see how you can get D-Music today. Well, Jay, we're going to start off with 8.34 meters. Think of it. Uh, Tyrone Smith, who held the record, previous record of 8.22, uh, which got him a medal, a gold medal, during the uh, some uh, games years ago. Um, but he's now healthy. He, as he says to me in an interview, uh, he's feeling good with the space he's in. Life is good. Training's going well. He feels good, and he felt it coming. Yeah, it's, it's, it's remarkable because many have counted him out basically as his career on the, on the back end, mm-hmm. on the down slope. Um, but to produce something like this, that 8.34, he would have been on the podium at the last Olympics. That's what's on the, the best of the best in the world. Mm-hmm. He would have been on the podium. And for most championships around the world, we probably would have came away with the gold because that 8.34 is one of the highest marks going. So, and he feels he can go jump even further. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there is a lot, I mean, it's still exciting to, to hear Tyra Smith because we've thought basically after the last year's Olympics, you know, and we heard a lot of athletes retiring from their sports. Um, Tyrone will hang around for a while, but you know, but no, he's still pressing on, and that, that's kudos to him because one thing about athletics, if you're feeling fit, and I think that's the m- major thing, mm-hmm. how your body's reacting. Mm-hmm. And sometimes when you pick up injury, sometimes you don't come back as strong, or even or even as good, and sometimes realistically, it's, it's hard to come to this, that reality. Sometimes right. after that injury, you can't duplicate what you was doing prior but now he's coming back and actually <laughs> doing what he did before so um, kudos to Tyrone well let's get the interview with the record holder for the men's long jump for Bermuda Tyrone Smith well first of all congratulations Tyrone Smith uh, new record set on Friday but you must be over the moon with how your season is progressing yeah I'm, uh, I'm definitely really happy and excited with the way it's it started you know it's a long season ahead but um, you know, it's, it really makes things a lot easier when you, you start off on the right foot. You know, I've got my World Championships qualifier already taken care of, uh, so now I get to just have fun until the until London uh, in August. What do you do now from here on in? Do you work on more technique, or uh, because you uh, three jumps over eight? Is, it's got to be something remarkable that you must be really, really pleased with. Definitely, you know, it was a. Uh, it's not just to be able to get a PR, but to also consistently be able to put an eight-meter jump together whenever whenever I need it, uh, because that's what's important on the for those all all too stressful qualifying rounds. Uh, so from here on, we do we work on technique, we work on turning the 830s into the 840s, and then hopefully into the 850s, so that we can go into world championships with a lot of confidence and um, just just knowing that we are, we're going to be in the final and that uh, we're going to be fighting for the medal so that you know we, we continue to get stronger and faster so my training will progress towards more speed and, and power um, get some more competitions in and uh, work just work the technique even more so 
because nothing's perfect. Uh, it's far from it, and uh, we're working towards that perfection. I can see as you're as you're hitting that 834, uh, big smile on your face midair because I've watched you over the <laughs> last few years at international competitions, <laughs> and when you when you feel as if you've hit that mark, it, you give out an ex expression. Did you feel going into it, you had a few eights in you? Uh, yeah, to be honest with you, you know, I felt uh, very very good about my training over the last couple of months. Um, in the last three weeks of training has been great. We started working a couple of different drills to uh, kind of give me a new perspective uh, when I'm in the air. And I knew that I had some eight meters in me. Uh, my goal that I had set forth, and I actually didn't tell anybody about it. Just was one thing I had in my head was I wanted to go 840 uh, at that meet. And I was like, I don't see why I can't. So um, matter of fact, the the jump, the, the 834 right before it, I uh, had a couple of friends were there. Uh, one who's a coach at one of the local universities, and she was filming her female jumpers because they had the females going on one pit and the men going on the other. I went up to her and asked if she could film. Uh, like, if you catch me coming down the runway, could you film my next couple jumps because I have a really good feeling a, a big one's coming. And she said, I'll try to get my, try my best. She wasn't able to get it, but I said that, and then, I don't know, five minutes later is when I jumped the, the, uh, <laughs> the 834. So I've been feeling really good. Um, in a good place in my life. I'm comfortable. I'm happy. Uh, training is going well, so all those things always lead to just better competing, better jumps. When you start off a season like this, you've been around it for quite some time now. What expectations do you put on yourself now, going, getting ready for the World Championships? Well, what what I look to do from here on out is to to make it a regular occurrence. Um, you know, if I'm jumping 8:34. Uh, this early, I expect to be going 820s on my bad days. Um, I, I expect to be able to put an 8-meter jump together every single competition, more than one 8-meter jump. Uh, so what I do here is, from here is, is, is get the consistency with it. So 820s, 830s for the, you know, the however many competitions I have leading up to uh, world championships. And um, if I'm consistent at the 820 or the 830, that means another PR PB is in the wings, and hopefully the, the massive one that I've really been waiting for all these years. Well, the buzz all weekend has been where we can't wait to see Tyrone in July at the Bermuda Area Permit Meet. It's going to be a big buzz because now if you're, if you're consistently jumping the eight, people are expecting that big one right here on home soil. <laughs> I'm going to try my best to deliver. I'm uh, having fun, and when that happens, I mean, that, that's when the big jumps come. Um, having a good time knowing that I'm in good good shape it's, uh, I'm going to have I'm going to have even to jump no matter what so if I just relax a little bit I can get a big one out there and that's kind of what happened on uh, on Friday because I opened up with a foul second jump was 8.01 and it didn't feel all that great <laughs> and I was like okay well it didn't feel great it was still 8 meters uh, so we'll just tune this up a little bit and we'll get a bigger one so that's I hope to bring that same mentality home well, Jay, on Saturday night, Nicky Bascom um, has improved his record. He's still uh, without a loss in his professional career. Um, but there's some discussion and some debate. Uh, according to the official stats, he's 6-0. Mm -hmm. um, we got him down as 7-0 uh, and in Bermuda, but the official stats indicate 6-0. and um, Your thoughts on his overall performance, the win, and... His position, as it stands now, ranked, I think, 609th in the welterweight division. Well, that's first all start on Saturday night. Once again, another professional um, fight. And when I see professional, all around fight itself, very professional. He took it on and managed to fight. And, and, and sometimes, you know, Nick is not a fighter. You know, in boxing, you're either a fighter or you're a boxer. Nick, Nick is a boxer. So a lot of times you got to manage fights. Right. You know, and I and he, and he does that quite well. Obviously his corner is very seasoned and you know they they've been around. Mm -hmm. They've seen a lot of fighters and they groomed him to to manage and he's been able to do that and, and you know coming away with a, with a victory um, the other night it builds well for him. Also the the Bermudian public cuz you always will love to see your fighter fight at home. Mm -hmm. The discussion comes after that. Where does Nikki go? And Earl, bro, 
I after the last fight, I think me personally, I, you've got me on tape saying that I think Nikki, it's time for Nikki to to spread his wings a bit, mm -hmm. get some tougher competition because Nikki is at the time, well, right now he's 26 years old. He's in the welterweight division, which is probably the most popular <laughs> division mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in boxing. Well, we have a new heavyweight champion now, right, but up right. until two weeks ago, mm -hmm. the welterweight is 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 the is the weight class. Mm -hmm. He's not gonna have that many more years at his top level. Mm -hmm. So you've got to try to get the best fights as possible to get have a better ranking. Now that all depends on, and we we keep on this with many shows, on what Nick's girl is. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, is it to break into 500? Is it to break into 400? Is it break into th whatever the case right. may be? We got, we don't know what his expectations are and what his goals are. And so in saying that, that is something that we probably have to get an interview with Nikki to see where, where is he trying to go with this? Or is he trying to bring some feel good to our local community that at the time we hear so much of the social ills to hear these good and see a good feeling event. Mm -hmm. It works for a community and it could probably do better for the community. But I did look at some stats last night, and, and I was trying to say, well, you know what? If he was to go away, he would have a better record. Well, actually, that doesn't pertain true when I looked at somebody. And I even went down to even 300. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you have a lot of guys who've only fought two professional fights. Right. Who have a higher ranking. But it's who you fight. So you fight. Yeah. And that's what it all comes back yeah. down to. Who's fighting? And then who's available at the time mm -hmm. you're ready to mm -hmm. fight. Yeah. And I think that's probably the most tricky part is trying to book a fight. Who's Who can give you a push in the rankings, but who's available? Mm -hmm. Um I saw a lot of people, okay, the guy who's just um, ranked 2000, I mean 608 mm -hmm. uh, from Poland. Right. He's yeah. fought all his fights in Poland. <laughs> but then you will see some guy, and he's fought, one one of the guys he's fought was uh, 12 wins and 45 losses. Oh, okay. yeah. But you, you say, well, how, regardless of the fact that you have to get into some tougher competition, uh, because we're talking about this is the same weight class that, that um, may rather... Pacquiao, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Canelo, Canelo the other night, Alvarez, um, Cesar Chavez Jr. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's packed. It's packed. It's packed. It's packed. Yeah. And that and that's we're just talking about the top five, six, seven names. We're mm -hmm. talking it's 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 packed. So it'd be interesting to hear the future plans for Nicky Basson because right now he he's he's got off a great start, mm -hmm. seven and well seven and zero we've heard, but when we've gone to these boxing sites you see they've only seen six and a mm -hmm. so we've got to see exactly what's come out of that but i'll be interested to hear from nikki well there was a bit of uh controversy over the over the weekend with the fight involved as um there was a couple of no-shows by some of the local media uh, due to um some some lateness in 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 the way it, the association wanted to handle certain things asking the media to come to a press conference and then putting that it's going to be restrictions but not clearing up what the restrictions would be learning something the day before about what you can and can't do after trying to pro help promote something is not the way me personally I would have liked to do it and and I refrain from from going to the fight because I didn't want the controversy of what you can and can't do finding out at the last minute we, we provide our viewers with uh, footage it, it, it could be a minute if that was the rule, but we need to know this ahead of time, well ahead of time, not the day before. And that's what I was trying to express to the uh, Bermuda Boxing Association. Um, but hopefully, prior to the next fight, uh, there could be some discussions, mm -hmm. and they could be open and frank discussions on how we, the media, mm -hmm. can help promote and get our viewers what they would like to see from an event. Well, Earl, this type of situation is not immune just to boxing. No. We've seen this in other sports. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the viewers come out on the bad end of the stick. Mm -hmm. And it's counterproductive because that's not what the associations initially want. Right. The, the, initially, they want the viewers to... Neither do the sponsors. The sponsors <laughs> and neither do the sponsors. Yeah. But what we see that's coming when it gets to this place here, or the common denominator, is the lack of communication. Mm -hmm giving somebody ample time to be communicated to. Mm -hmm. 
because just because I tell you, but you told me two days or a day before, mm -hmm. that'll make think everything is good. Right. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> it's, it's not. not. <laughs> you because put so many things in place to put, prepare for it. And then, obviously, outside entities may have their own sponsors mm -hmm. and their own fan base to mm -hmm. live up to. So, it's just, I think, where all the parties have to understand that there has to be a better timeline. Mm -hmm. And we talk about a timeline where there's things up in the National Sports Center, period. Mm -hmm. Because any event up there goes by so fast, I don't, I don't care if it is six, seven, eight o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. If there's not a timeline put in place for three weeks prior, mm -hmm. right down to marking the field, mm -hmm. putting up a 10, bathrooms, whatever the case may be, these timelines have, and then according to the timeline, each entity needs to say, okay, this is what's gonna to pertain to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna use for example for the media, they might want to do some pre shots before mm -hmm. the event. Mm -hmm. Well, when can I get access? I might wanna get um, some of the um, athletes who mm -hmm. when can I get access? Mm -hmm. All these things, if these things are put up front, then everybody knows where they stand. Mm -hmm. All the entities can say, okay, well, if you're doing it this time, then my time is slotted here, or mm -hmm. we slot them around. Whatever the case is, I think the communication side has to, has to get better when it comes to putting on major events on this island. Yeah. Well, from the boxing ring to the heat yes. of Ooh. the Dominican Republic. Got a chance to speak with Dominique May, who finished 35th in the Pan American Championships. Um, we'll see how it, it all pans out for the availability of qualifications for bigger events. Mm -hmm. um, as we all know, only two persons from each country can qualify for the likes of the Pan Am, uh, CAC Games, and that stuff. So uh, we'll have to see how the countries all uh, panned out. And hopefully he gets a spot into the Pan American Games, Commonwealth Games, and uh, for that matter, the Olympics. Hmm. But uh, let's get the interview with Dominique Mayo from the hot and humid Dominican Republic. Dominique Mayo finished 35th, competing in the 32nd Pan American World Race Championships. In Santo Domingo, Mayo competed in the men's elite race that covered a distance of 170 kilometers. Mayo, who has been training and competing in Belgium, talked about the hot conditions in Santo Domingo. For the last month or so, I've been in Belgium where it averages about 40 degrees. <laughs> but like, bringing layers of clothes, and yesterday I wanted to take everything off. <laughs> really hot. Open up a world of music at your fingertips and access millions of songs from free with DMusic, exclusively from Digicel. With DMusic, you can stream and download songs and create playlists of your favorite artists to fit your lifestyle. Whether you're working out at the gym, getting ready for a Friday night, or just chilling at home, DMusic comes with one gig of free data to stream and download songs without it impacting your data usage. That's 32 hours worth of music. Visit us in store or online to see how you can get DMusic today. Well, Jay, you heard Dominique talk about he wanted to take all his clothes off. He goes from uh, wanting to put clothes on in Belgium to wanting to take all his clothes off in the Dominican Republic. Yeah, we, we've talked about this many times. It's like you can, you can have all the preparation you want, the best gear, the prettiest shoes, sure. the most oil on the wheels. But on the day, mm -hmm. <laughs> Mother Nature might have a whole nother problem, set of problems for you. Sure. And that it could very alter your, your plans. Well, Dominique was soaking wet mm -hmm. from sweat on the local front. Uh, the competitors on Sunday in Hamilton were soaking wet <laughs> from the rain. There weren't too many people upset with it. I mean, the cyclists probably had a little fear going around some of those corners, but we've been in a drought and we needed rain and unfortunately it came on Sunday. But let's get the report from the cycle racing, the Bicycle Works crit in Hamilton on Sunday. The local front, the Bermuda Bicycle Association's road race season continued with the Bicycle Works Criterium on a wet morning in Hamilton. Matthew Oliveira won the adult A division race with a time of 50-22.7. Connor White finished second one lap down and Dave McCombs finished third. A time of 32-34.1 saw Rosanna Hoy win the women's A division race. Sarah Bonnet was second in 32-42.3 and Louise Wells finished third one lap down. Well, Jay, on Sunday, also, well, just before the rain came, um, a race to honor a running legend yes. uh, takes place just before the Bermuda Day holiday every year, and that's the Sir Stanley Burgess 5K road race. 
Um, different route due to works going on in and around Bermuda. A little more challenging for some, but Chase Smith and Gail Lindsay ran to victory on Sunday. Um, Chase covering the distance in 16.22. Gail finishing high ranked in the top, I think she finished seventh. Um, but everybody's jostling for position for the Bermuda Day Half Marathon. But I don't want to uh, discredit the fact that a race in the honor of, of a legend took place. So let's get the report from Sunday who won and the top three in male and female of the Sir Stanley Burgess 5K Red Race. All right, okay. Three, two, one. Well, I know everyone's worried about who's running May 24 and who's not running. Uh, Chase ran through the finish line and kept on running. <laughs> He's staying away from the microphones. Uh, I got a chance to interview a few people after the race. Gail Lindsay being one, she was down as one of the favorites uh, for the women's title without Ashley, without Rosanna. But she dropped a bombshell. She's not competing because she's preparing for um, the Island Games. And she's been doing a lot of track running. Then we got a chance to speak to Tim Price who is planning to run, but I'm not sure if he's going to be allowed to run because he's not been in Bermuda long enough to qualify. So he plans to run the race, but he'll be an unofficial runner. Um, so the discussions would be, your, um, say you're a media covering the race mm -hmm. and uh, Tim Price is leading. Do you let him run by your vehicle, or do you follow, or do you lead? Oh, you don't follow him. Okay. It's unofficial. <laughs> I'm only, you know, I'm due to follow the official runners. Yeah, well, I mean, anybody else in the world, I mean, you can run. It's like somebody runs up alongside another runner, eventually. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there's a distinct possibility this could actually happen. Yeah. Um, what do we do? Um, Keep running, <laughs> <laughs> but we can't allow you go down the lane of to to the finish line to Dotton Avenue. To Dotton right. Avenue, and and that would probably be to to probably, I think that would probably be the ideal thing to do is not allow him to run down Dotton Avenue, mm. you know, because you're talking pictures and film and all that stuff. So you don't want to have any confusion, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. especially when you're talking about archives. And I'm looking at the future. Right. Okay. Well, hold on. He, but he don't have a number, mm. but he. You know, it, it can get confused. Right, right. Um, that would be my thing. Yeah. No, mind you, I don't know what the rules are when it comes the, to... The me. rules are you have to be on the island, living on the island, six months before the race. Mm -hmm. um, he confirmed to me. Mm -hmm. um, he was here at the end of November. His work permit came uh, in January. Mm -hmm. So, technically, he is not eligible, eligible to run the race. Be interesting because, I mean, like I said, we, we, we've heard... No, no, a few, few runners are not going to take part in the hop this one yeah. of our prestigious race but in saying that I, I keep saying that this leaves the door open for somebody else and some new people to come into the scene that we haven't heard yeah. in the top it actually makes it that much more exciting Most definitely. more people will now tune in because there's going to be a new name yes there could be an old name but yes. there's gonna be a new name that hasn't been on that podium yeah. for a very long time I'm just gonna throw this out there because as far as we know that Chris Estonic will be running. But he's undecided. So I found that out yesterday. So he's still undecided. So so let so let's say, just for the sake of argument, for today, mm -hmm. let's say that he's not running. Yeah. Can you imagine the race now coming out of St. George? Oh boy, it'll be a lot <laughs> I tell you what, it'll be a very slow pace. Yeah. It'll be a slow pace because people's gonna wanna save everything until they get into town. So it'll be a lot of jostling at the beginning. People will, will go out in a pace, and then it opens it up to who can out-sprint each other for that last probably two and a half miles because no one's going to want to go out and ruin it for themselves. Mm -hmm. They're going to want to save as much as they can, mm -hmm. see how everybody else is feeling. Mm -hmm. You'll see a guy give a little push here and there. Um, but, hey, it's there. Now those ones who were taking that time off and not putting in the work, now I was saying to myself, man, if I'd have done this two months ago, I could be in the mix. But on the day, Jay, as you know, in sports, you never know how you're going to feel. You could put yourself right in the mix, right up past Montpelier. It almost reminds me of Earl, the cycle race mm. that precedes this race. Yeah. 
you know, you've have you've got many contenders, mm-hmm. but basically it comes down probably for the last thirty yards yeah. that can actually who actually wins the race. Yeah. And when you talk about names coming back into contention, um, we said a few weeks ago, Kevin Smith's out there running some good times. Okay. <laughs> and if he goes to the start line, he instantly becomes a favorite. Right away. If there's no Christmas Twanick and Kevin Smith lines up on the start line, he instantly becomes a favorite just because of his record. Can you imagine? Jay Donovan, same thing. He can, he becomes a favorite. Yeah. Jay Smith has been running and is consistent at the shorter distance. Mm-hmm. If he puts together a good day, he can automatically become a favorite. Yeah. We talked about Tyler Smith, but Tyler Smith won't be. He, he won't be. He'll he be, fin- he be finishing his final exam on that day. So. His final <laughs> exam. So it, could be, it could build well for the event um, in general, because of the fact that, you know, the unknown, mm-hmm. the unknown, and even when they all get to that starting line, they look across at each other. Well, whose day is it? Yeah, yeah. So that's something that we will probably have to closely monitor here on Island Stats. This will be one of the first races that, when we go to the start line for both male and female, mm-hmm. there will be interest in both races. And when I say interest, no one's guaranteed to come first if Chris doesn't run for the, especially for the for the male, and then for the female, no one's guaranteed. Okay, now a question for you. Yeah. Um, Alice, stats. <laughs> you you're in one vehicle. Who do you cover, male or female? Don't worry about that. I got a plan. <laughs> I tell you my plan. Everybody else can use the same plan, and it don't cons- and it don't have anything to do with real real escape. <laughs> But let's get the interviews from Sunday with the lead up to Bermuda Day Half Marathon Derby. Gil, obviously you put in the work, you put in the effort uh, to come out on top today, special day. Yeah, it was good fun. Um, I was kind of hoping it was last year's course because I knew that would be a fast one. So um, it was tough finishing up Frog Lane. So harder than I was kind of expecting it to be, but it was good fun. Does this put kind of May 24th being it, it, it's it's a course that's only been run for the second time this year um, that a lot of people haven't run before does this kind of set you up for understanding some of those hills that will be in place right out of St. George? Uh, so I'm not actually doing May 24th this year no I'm um, training for shorter distances just now so um, put that on hold for this year and maybe try next year. I see you're doing a lot of track work um, what are you really getting ready for? Island Games, it's the end of June, yeah. So you're looking to do the 8, because I see you doing a lot of 8 yeah. and maybe 15? Yeah, exactly, yeah. All right, so the, the road work is helping you build that stamina and that strength? Yeah, exactly. You need to go through uh, multiple rounds in the track, so just having the endurance helps. Now, did you sign up for the Legends series? No, mainly because they were all 10Ks, and I've been sticking to 5, so. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, good luck, congratulations. Thank you very much, thank you. All right, Tim, coming into the race, obviously you were the points leader, just managing your, your run today. Yeah, um, the goal was to stay ahead of Kevin, who was in second, and I think it was the guy in third, and yeah, I managed to do it. Of course, Chase was miles ahead of me, but it was good. It was a good run. You start a race off and it's straight downhill, so obviously the body's going through different dynamics as you start. How do you put that all into a rhythm to make sure that for the rest of the race you're, you're at a comfortable pace? For this, it's just an all-out sprint. Try not to fall over going downhill and then, yeah, just grit through the, the second uphill half. But, yeah, just controlling your momentum on that whatever mile or so of downhill at the beginning. You get going pretty quick. Yeah. Now, obviously, everyone wants to know if you're competing or you're scheduled to compete in the 24th of May uh, Half Marathon Derby. I'll planning on running it. Um, yeah, as long as no injuries come up or anything, I'll, I'll run it. It'll be a race of attrition. <laughs> see, <laughs> see what the heat does to everybody. So that's, it'll make it fun, interesting. What are some of the things you've heard about May 24th? Because this will be your first? Yes, yes, it'll be my first. Um, hot, very hot. <laughs> So uh, we ran the course last weekend with uh, Mac does a practice run of it. So did that first half pretty pretty nice, pretty flat, and then you come up out of flats and it's hills and hills. So 
yeah, it, it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it. What what type of things have you been doing to prepare for that race, um, knowing what what challenges is going to be? Midday runs, so running when it's hot out, it's gonna it's not gonna be fun, but it'll get you ready for the race. Um, that's gonna be the biggest factor is getting acclimated to that that hot temperature running. Um, and I mean, we're in Bermuda, so you're gonna run hills regardless of where you go. <laughs> so yeah, biggest thing's heat management and hydration. If you find yourself in the mix, what's some of the strategies you're going to have to use? I know you don't want to give up no secrets, but, but what type of strategies are you going to have to use to ensure that you, you can actually cross the line first? Just hold on to those guys in front of you and hope that last two miles through town where it's a little bit of hills, you can take them on there. That and, yeah, just race smart. Don't try to push yourself too hard. And if it is hot, which everyone is banking on, just manage the heat well and make sure you have something left at the end. Well, congratulations. Thank you. All right, Mr. Oliver, obviously you've been around for a number of years. Um, your memories of, of, of May 24th when you uh, first arrived? Okay, I ran May 24th, first time in 1973, out of, out of Hamilton into Somerset. No, that's not wrong. Somerset to, to Hamilton, yeah. But prior to that, I'd just come to the island not long before. I remember watching in, in flats. I remember watching Carl Bean. I can't remember if Hansi was there that year, in 1972, but Carl Bean, he was clear, coming out of St. George's that year. And since then, in spite of what the adverts and TV have said, they have not come out of St. George's until the last couple of years. We have run to St. David one time, but, but apart from that, it's pretty much all been uh, Somerset into town. Did you take part in the one to St. David? Yes, I did. It was a nightmare, <laughs> really. That was on Marinette Bean, was the first lady. And of course, I thought no woman's going to beat me, but of course, she beat me. <laughs> You've been involved in, in the sport of track and field for a long time and, and running as part of that as well. So, a uh, historian a bit? Oh, yeah. I've, I've got a lot of scrapbooks and stuff back home, particularly back in the day when I was more enthusiastic than I am now. I used to have all the race results right back to uh, early 70s, I guess. We, and we used to run against Stanley Burgess in those days, but Stanley he used to run out of Somerset and we used to run, have to run a couple of laps. And Stanley used to run straight out the door, so you're running along the road, you're way behind this 74-year-old man. And you say, oh, you can't beat an old man. <laughs> but a lot of memories of the actual race? Oh, yeah, a lot of good, good memories, really, yeah, yeah, when, when the days I was reasonably fit, yeah, yeah. I used to even like the heat in those days because I did a lot of training at lunchtime and I used to think it's hot, that still suits me. You know, it made it harder, but harder for other people more than me. So, but the times are so much slower nowadays, you know, I did 125 was my best and I was probably about 50th. Nowadays 125 would be top 10 for sure, yeah. All right, well, we look forward to seeing you. Will you be running this year? Oh no, I won't be running. <laughs> These days are definitely gone, yeah. <laughs> uh Bermuda, listen up. D Music is here exclusively for Digicel customers. Open up a world of music at your fingertips and access millions of songs from free. With D Music, you can easily search for your favorite artists and create playlists to fit your lifestyle. Plus, you have the option to download music to your device so you can find the song for any moment, even when offline. D Music comes with one gig of free data to stream and download songs without it impacting your data usage. That's 32 hours worth of music. Visit us in store or online to see how you can get D Music today. Well, day, day yesterday, it was uh, what we consider runs of plenty, finally. Finally. Uh, Dowry Rollins been struggling a little bit, but cricketers go through that patch. Mm -hmm. uh, he got 40 runs, got a wicket, 25 runs, 8.1 overs a maiden, uh, helping Sussex seconds defeat Kent. But as you said, finally. Um, going through, because you used to be a batsman, going through that patch, what are you constantly telling yourself? What could he be possibly telling himself? that will get him out of that particular slump? Well, I mean, first thing first is stay patient. Mm. Stay patient, you know, and one thing, you know, coaches will keep saying, just watch the ball, watch mm. the ball out of the hand, watch mm. the ball out of the hand. Because all the training that you've done, when you get into a game, it should instinctively happen. Mm. What happens a lot of times, we, we go, your batsmen go, they're preconceived what they want to do, da, da, da. And, and sometimes you see him get stuck in between two minds. We see that a lot of times. Instead of if you train and train and train, then instinctively it will automatically happen. And the most successful batsman, you that, that's one of the things they would tell you. You know, their training has already been done. So now I see the ball, I hit the ball, or whatever the case may be. Um, but for him, you know, 
the best part of his game is his patience. Mm -hmm. Him occupying the crease and and, then cricket, you know, stick to the wicket and the runs will come. Mm -hmm. That's his game. So, um, but he's been put in a position, you know, know, that, okay, number one, you you just, you're young and they throw you way up the order or you got to secure an innings. Mm -hmm. So it's had a lot of different scenarios, but as a coach or, or, or even back, you just stay impatient because, like I said, the days can come. Yeah. I, I'm looking at the fact that he's playing, he played a 50 over match um, yesterday. He would have played a three day match mm-hmm. uh, over the weekend, three which would have days. finished on Saturday. Uh, he'll have a two day match coming up this week. Mm-hmm. Um, the different forms of, of the game take a different approach. Uh, obviously, in a 50 over match, you want to be scoring runs regularly, although you want to be patient. He betted an hour and 23 minutes mm-hmm. yesterday for his 40. Mm-hmm. Um, they had lost an early wicket, and lost a few wickets around him where he was able to have a 51 run, fifth wicket partnership before he departed. But uh, it's going to be the, the mindset has to change each time you go to bat because the format changes. Did you find a struggle when you were playing? I mean, you, you and you played, we were playing 100 overs <laughs> aside. <laughs> or was it 60 overs? <laughs> but obviously, when you come to the shorter version, your whole approach has to change. Yeah, and it was a little bit different then because we didn't have the introduction of 2020. And then 2020 has really changed the mindset of, of, of looking at your approach to the game. Uh, when you c- came from open cricket to the 50 over, you know, one of the biggest things for openers, and he's our top order batsman, is to see the first 10 over through, take the shine off the ball, is what the, mm-hmm. the coaches will always say, take the shine off. Well, now what it is, <laughs> shine or no shine, the field is, because with the field and restrictions, the field is up, let's go over the top or let's go through them. Um, go, they say go hard and heavy. That's the biggest thing now, go hard and heavy. So the game has changed a bit. Um, but you always love to see that our batsman does wild round when it's time for him to go hard and have he's still going to make shots. It's not going reckless at a ball and playing unorthodox shots because nine times the chances are you can get up more times than you be successful. Uh, but with him, with open day cricket, it's just about sometimes your batting time. And we see we see these problems arise with cup match. Mm-hmm. You know, all during the league. They are betting basically overs, mm-hmm. but in cup match, there's gonna be some scenarios where you got to bet time. Yeah. You know, bet time and going into an interval, a tea interval, or a lunch interval, or the end of day's play, and to protect the wicket or protect what you gotta do. So we see a lot of the batsmen here on the island struggle with that when it comes to that part of the game. Mm-hmm. Now, with him playing maybe two formats <laughs> a week, you're also talking about. A different ball. Mm. (laughs) We all know that a red ball swings a lot more and and it lasts longer than a white ball. A white ball doesn't last as long. So a lot of different variables about cricket that you really got to to be up on your training and and practice and practices. I mean, he's getting some of the best practices out there. (laughs) Well, you talked about it. It locally, we went to the 20 format. We're in the second week of that. Um, Some big scores put up. Uh, in short overs, you look at uh, Willicott scored 210 and 20. St. George scored 111. Um, you know, so it, it, that that is mathematically what you're talking about: the change of style, the change of being a little more aggressive when when batsmen start counting balls and saying, "Oh, uh, you know, we only we start out with X amount of balls." You know, for the 50 overs is 300. Mm-hmm. You know, for 2020. Yeah. Hey, considerably less, and you have to make the most out of each yeah. inning. And every time you go to bat, you want to you price your, you you put a price on your your wicket. You know. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and that's that's where um, you hope these players can make the transition when we start the 50 over mm. league. Yeah. Well, let's get the report from Dalry Rollins over in the UK and the weekend wrap up of local 2020 cricket, as well as there was a transfer. A late transfer. And I learn. And I learn. I learn you to me and you learn I learn you to me and you learn me to you. Learning cricket? Yeah, I learn.
Darry Rollins and his Sussex second teammate picked up a win by 89 runs over Kent Seconds. Kent Seconds won the toss and elected to field first. Sussex was scored 222 for 7 and there allotted 50 overs. Nick Bouch was the top scorer with 72, while Rollins added 40. Rollins was at the wicket for 83 minutes. He faced 71 deliveries, hitting 7 fours. In reply, Kent Seconds were bowled out for 133. Chris Haggett was their top scorer with 30, while Alexander Woodland led the Sussex bowlers with figures of 6 overs, 2 for 20. Rollins bowled 8.1 overs. He had one maiden. He took one for 25. Meanwhile, the Bermuda Cricket Board have confirmed a player transfer and a player loan. Ben Phipps has transferred from Flats Victoria to St. George's Cricket Club, while Amari Dean Simons has gone out on loan from St. David's Cricket Club to St. George's Cricket Club. Willowcots defeated PHC by 51 runs in their 2020 match at the Summers the Cricket Club. Willowcots batted first and scored 210 for 5 in their lot of 20 overs. Bergen Spencer and Dwight Baston both scored 38 runs. Colin Stewart was the pick of the PHC bowlers with figures of 4 overs, 1 for 27. In reply, PHC could only manage 169 for 6 in their 20 overs. Dean Richards was the top scorer with 90 not out, with Tyshawn Brown, the pick of the Willicott bowlers, returning figures of 4 overs, 3 for 15. In other 2020 matches, St. George's Cricket Club won by 39 runs in their 11 over match against Devonshire Recreation Club. St. George's scored 100 for 5 and restricted Devonshire Recreation Club to 61 for 4. Western Stars won their match against Flats Victoria by 8 wickets. Flats Victoria batted first and scored 81 for 8, and Western Stars scored 84 for 2. LJ, over the weekend, uh, Olympian Rebecca Halliger was in swimming action in Denmark. Um, she's been competing regularly where she's now residing uh, and doing a lot of training. Uh, the fact that she entered into two finals bodes well for her confidence and you know looking at the time she's she is already planning to come back for the national championships right here at the national sports center pool so let's get the report from rebecca halliger competing over in denmark muta olympic swimmer rebecca halliger competed in the firearm cup in denmark a time of 58 41 so halliger clocked the third fastest time in the women's 100 meter freestyle final halliger finished second competing in the women's 50 meter freestyle final when she touched the wall in a time of 26 88 well, Jay, on, over the weekend, two youngsters, Kayla Bingham and Nick Pilgrim, competed in Virginia in a youth triathlon. Uh, both handled themselves considerably well. Let's get the report of the two youngsters competing over in the U.S. Youngsters Nicholas Pilgrim and Caleb Ingham competed in the East Coast Triathlon Festival in Virginia. Competing in the elite male youth division among 64 competitors, Pilgrim finished ninth with a time of 31.14.3, while Ingham crossed the line 35th in a time of 33.03.1. Well, Jay, if you happen to drive through Hamilton along Front Street on Saturday or Sunday, you would have seen up to 38 youngsters competing um, in the Open BIC National Championships. Now, a lot of people will say, well, I've never heard of this. It's an event we've hosted on several occasions, and during the America's Cup, we're actually hosting the North American Championships as well. Um, but we had youngsters competing, battling hard, in some tricky, tricky conditions. Um, Saturday, as we all know, it might have been overcast. And it, the breeze oh, was kicking. It was, and there was a lot of capsizing going on. There was a lot of challenging, but they stuck with it. They stuck with it. Let's get the overall champions and the report from Saturday and Sunday of the Open Bank National Championships in the Hamilton Harbor. 38 Bermuda youngsters took to the waters of Hamilton Harbor on Saturday and Sunday, looking for the six available spots up for grabs for the America's Cup Endeavor Open. Sebastian Kemp finished on top of the leaderboard with 22 net points. Kemp recorded three wins, four seconds, and two thirds over the two days. Aiden Lopes finished second with 24 net points, while Azai Smith finished third with 26 net points. Following two days of coverage of the Bermuda Open Big National Championships that took place in the Hamilton Harbor on Saturday and Sunday, Day, we can reveal the winners of each division. Gabriella Braxton was crowned on the Bermuda Open Big Female Sailor, while Aiden Loops was the male. The Bermuda National overall champion was Sebastian Kemp, while Genevieve Lau took the girls' title. Christopher Raymond won the Endeavor Sailors title, with Jesse DeBrega taking the female title. Open up a world of music at your fingertips and access millions of songs from free with D Music, exclusively from Digicel. With D Music, you can stream and download songs and create playlists of your favorite artists to fit your lifestyle. 
Whether you're working out at the gym, getting ready for a Friday night, or just chilling at home, DMusic comes with one gig of free data to stream and download songs without it impacting your data usage. That's 32 hours worth of music. Visit us in store or online to see how you can get DMusic today. Well, Jay, from the water to a place that needs water, the baseball. YAO baseball took place on Saturday, and looking at some of the footage of you to seeing it, uh, <laughs> dust, dust flying everywhere, everywhere. Uh, let's get the report from Saturday's YAO baseball down in the East End. In YAO baseball action in the East End on Saturday, the Angels stayed in it until the end. They had built a 7-0 lead, but the Marlins chipped away and then pulled away late with a 14-8 victory. A walk-off homer left the Cubs on the wrong end of a 15-14 defeat to the Angels in the second game of the day. The game was tied at 14, with the Angels batting in the bottom of the sixth, then Stefan Painter homered for the win. Well, history repeated itself. It might have taken... 20 odd years and more, but history repeated itself. Dwayne Pierman successfully defended his Johnny Walker <laughs> professional title 22 years after winning it at the Ocean View Golf Course. Yeah, congratulations. To, um, you know, that's a long time. Yeah. It's a yeah. long time. But obviously, um, Solid days of golf. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel Augustus yeah. gave him a run. Yeah, but he was able to see him off. Um, and after the first round, he, he had a lead on the first round. Right. Was able to see him off. Um, but it's it, it's it's 22 years later. And that uh, senior playoff, uh, quite dramatic. Uh, congratulations to Kevin Trot uh, for holding off Alan Bradshaw, and of course uh, the the amateur open. Uh, Leroy Robinson ran into the second day leading. Mm -hmm. uh, well, he was tied for the lead. Tied for the lead. And uh, Damian Pagliande was able to put together a solid performance to win by four strokes. Bet in windy conditions again. Um, but he stuck to the guns and was able to win it. Let's get the report from Sunday's roundup of the Johnny Walker Classic at the Ocean View Golf Course. There was an exciting finish to the Johnny Walker Classic with a playoff for first place in the senior amateur division between Kevin Trott and Alan Bradshaw. Trott will win on the first playoff hole, which was on the 18th at the Ocean View Golf Course. Both players shot second round, one over par 74s. Damian Pagliande once again showed his form and won the open amateur division by four strokes over Leroy Robinson. Pagliande shot a second round, three under par 67, while Robinson shot a second round, one over par 71. In the professional division, Dwayne Pearman won by a convincing margin. He claimed the title by six strokes over Daniel Augustus. Pearman stroked a second round four under par 66 with Augustus shooting a one under par 69. Bermuda, listen up. D Music is here exclusively for Digicel customers. Open up a world of music at your fingertips and access millions of songs from free. With D Music, you can easily search for your favorite artists and create playlists to fit your lifestyle. Plus, you have the option to download music to your device so you can find a song for any moment, even when offline. DMusic comes with one gig of free data to stream and download songs without it impacting your data usage. That's 32 hours worth of music. Visit us in-store or online to see how you can get DMusic today. Well, Jay, there it is. Um, you're going to pick up your golf clubs, um, take on... You, you take on Dewey and I'll take on Leroy. Cool. I hit him in the knee with my club. <laughs> <laughs> he might still be able to swing. Not after I finish it. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking violence. To some. To some, that's a sport. It, and competition. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, that's it for this edition of the Digital Sports Show right here on islandstats.com. I'm your host, Earl Baston, and... I'm Jason. Juggling Jay. Do enjoy your evening.